We've all heard the terms VO2 or VO2 max test, but what does that actually mean? Today I'm here in London and I'm actually going to put myself through one of the tests to show you exactly what it entails, what the results show and how we can use it to improve our training. It sounds like this test is going to be painful, so if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, like and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. Today I am here at the Human Performance Lab in London with Richard, ready to get my VO2 max tested. Now, VO2 max is thrown around a lot, but what does it actually mean? Yeah, good question. Um, so generally speaking, and I always like to view it as your VO2 max is the size of your aerobic engine. Um, more scientifically, VO2 max is the maximum amount of oxygen that your body can consume and then convert to energy. Great. And how exactly do we test this number? So how it's tested is that you're going to be hooked up to a gas analyzer. Uh, we're going to put you through a running protocol. Starts off with very, very low intensity and gradually increases by one kilometer per hour. And it's designed to take you to your absolute maximum. And what the machine is doing is measuring the volume of oxygen coming in versus the volume of carbon dioxide coming out. And then that will give us, by the end, your VO2 max. That sounds quite painful. Um, and how, when we've got this number at the end, do I utilise that into my training? How do I improve on that number? Yeah, so we want endurance athletes to have as large an engine size as possible. So we can identify it potentially as a limiting factor to performance. So if someone has a relatively low VO2 max, we can then look at ways through their training to try and optimise it. Um, we'll also get certain ventilatory thresholds, heart rate training zones, so you can just kind of prescribe your training a little bit more precisely and individualised rather than just going off a little bit of guesswork. And how often would you say somebody like, like me needs to come and get tested? Um, generally speaking, I would say between 8, 10 and 12 weeks. Um, whenever you put a plan in place, you want to leave an incubation period to, to allow that plan to work. Um, so if you can come in at the start of a program, we get some data, we can base your training off your data that we collect, put the plan in place and then 8, 10, 12 weeks later come back in and retest and then see where you are and adjust the plan according to the results. Okay, I'm a bit nervous about this, but I'm going to go get my kit on and then you can tell me exactly what we need to do. Okay, I'm ready. What exactly is going to happen next? Cool. So, piece of equipment that we're going to use is obviously the treadmill. Okay, we've got a heart rate monitor. That's going to sit just underneath the breastbone. That's going to give us a real life data on how your heart rate is responding to the level of exercise. Um, fancy gas mask. Okay, what this is doing is measuring the volume of oxygen that's coming in versus the volume of carbon dioxide coming out. So that is going to give us all the information from that regard. In terms of the testing protocol, really, really simple test. It's an incremental step test. What that means is that it's going to start at a very, very low intensity, six kilometers an hour, which should be walking pace for you. And then every minute, we're going to increase the speed of the treadmill by one kilometer per hour until you reach your point of maximum exhaustion. I have a feeling this is going to be like a microwave minute, the longest minute of my life. People have said that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the first two minutes, we're just getting some resting data off us so we can see we've, we've got some baseline values to, to go off. And then once the test is over, we then have one minute where Emily is just resting as she is just to try and catch her breath. And we can then pick out some recovery data for her as well. So how fast her heart rate drops within that minute's recovery. In three, two, one, and off we go. So nice slow walking pace. Okay, up to speed seven. So that's the first stage done. Slight increase in speed. All right, coming up to 10 kilometers an hour. Awesome, Emily, come on, keep it going, keep it going. Loads in the tank here, come on. So we're getting to a pretty high intensity now, so Emily's gonna be working pretty hard. Though I still think she's got a little bit left in her, but it's now getting pretty, pretty tough. Go on then, Emily, let's push now. 
Push it hard, push hard, push hard. Come on, keep going, keep going. Brilliant, well done. Okay, just hold it there. Okay, so we just get one minute of you now, just catching your breath. Okay, just nice and relaxed, try not to talk. Just get one minute, just catching your breath. Well done, um, hot pot's over. Uh, so now when we go through the results, we can just pick out some key factors that we think that we can improve on that are ultimately going to help you improve your performance. Um, so the whole reason for the test was to do a VO2 max test. So the first thing we want to go through is what your VO2 max is. So as previously said, your VO2 max is the maximum amount of oxygen that your body can consume and then convert that through to energy. Okay. Now, the bigger the VO2 max, okay, the bigger the engine that person has, and the bigger the aerobic engine that person has. And we want you endurance athletes to have as big a engine as possible. So what we can see on the screen, okay, so your VO2 max is scored at 49, okay? So what that is, is that 49 milliliters of oxygen per minute per kilo can be consumed as a maximum and converted to energy, okay? Okay, so what this traffic light system is doing that you can see is that it's grading you against your own demographic, okay? So we're not comparing you to world-class endurance athletes, okay? It's comparing you to other people such as yourself in the same kind of demographic, okay? So we can see that your VO2 max places you in the excellent category, which is awesome, mm -hmm. okay? Um, so VO2 max, yes, we can always improve our VO2 max, but it's largely determined by our genetics. Okay, just so that I could become, try to become a sprinter, I'm never going to beat Usain Bolt. Okay, I could get faster, I'm just never going to be fast. Okay, so when we do look to try and improve VO2 max, largely that degree of improvement is going to be capped by our genetics. Okay, so if we take you through to the next stage, okay, so if we've got your VO2 max, which is the size of your engine, okay, what we're now looking for is how efficient is that engine, how many miles to the gallon can that engine do. Now, unlike VO2 max, this is very, very trainable, okay? So this is a part of your training that we can really, really work on that is ultimately going to lead to better performance, okay? So, what we're looking at here are these two key thresholds, okay? So we've got ventilatory, ventilatory threshold one and ventilatory threshold two, okay? Now, VT1 is the point at which you essentially will stop working aerobically. So, as a triathlete, your sport is a hugely aerobic sport. So if we can increase the speed that you can operate, but still under aerobic conditions, that's going to transfer over to your performance in a really, really positive way. Okay. So what we can see is that you hit your VT1 threshold at 63% of your VO2 max. Okay. What that corresponds to from a heart rate perspective, Okay, as you can see down the bottom left, is that our heart rate of 149 beats per minute, which is 80% okay, of the maximum heart rate that you achieved, which was 187. Yep. So at 80% of your max heart rate, do you stop working aerobically? Okay. okay. Now, with training, if we can increase that, that threshold to a higher percentage, what that would mean is that you're able to work to a higher percentage of your VO2 max, but still under aerobic conditions. So ultimately you can run faster, but it's not costing you anymore. The miles to the gallon is improved. Okay. Which I guess is helpful in a triathlon if I'm expending energy on the bike, but still yeah. I can save some in the tank for the run. 100%, so right. if you can carry out your triathlon largely aerobic, but running at a faster pace, that's gonna transfer to a faster, faster result. Okay, so going back, we've established that I may not be able to improve my VO2 max, but I could definitely make some improvements on my efficiency. So yeah. how do I get more efficient for when I come back to you and test again in 12 weeks time? So personally looking at your data, I would say spending more time in that zone two domain. So working below that first VT1 threshold. Um, we know that, like I said, that Triathlon is a, an aerobic event or aerobic sport. So if we're going too far beyond that, then we're going to be training the wrong, wrong energy system that is required for that sport. So if we were to put a plan in place, I'd say for the next 10 to 12 weeks, make some real, real targeted efforts to do that low intensity work. So I like the polarized approach. So 80% of your work at that low intensity, 
and 20% of your training work needs to be at that very, very top end set, top end. Which is that zone five we were talking about. That disgusting zone, yeah. Dying at the end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that is what a VO2 max session entails. I'm exhausted. I'm gonna go home and train for the next 12 weeks, try to get more efficient before my next lot of testing. I hope you enjoyed this video, I hope you found it useful. Let us know in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe.